This is your ultimate stop for everything sports. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Should I say more? From the NFL, MLB, the NBA, to MMA. It's all in here. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Listen now. Hello, everybody. I want to welcome you guys to another episode of the GSMC Sports Podcast from the GSMC Podcast Network. My name is Chris Blades, and before we get started here today, I want to make sure I remind you guys to subscribe to the podcast, make sure you never miss an episode, make sure you're always on top of whenever we're dropping stuff. Um, if you can, give us a five-star rating and review. It's very helpful. It will allow us to continue to get better, see what you guys like, see what you guys didn't like. It's, it's very appreciative if you could if you could take the time out to give us a rating and review. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, anywhere where you have social media. We're on there too, so just give us a follow. We can interact that way as well. And with you guys are hearing this now on Friday, so that means the week is coming to an end, which means the NFL playoffs are almost upon us. We got a full slate of, well, not full, but we got two games Saturday, two games Sunday. And I want to talk to you about all of them. Uh, first one's off with the Saturday games, the all AFC day, which is, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is like, this is pretty new in terms of normally they try to split up one AFC game, one day, um, one AFC, one NFC game Saturday, one AFC, one NFC game Sunday. This year, for whatever reason, they decided to go all AFC on Saturday, all AFC on Sunday. Um, I mean, we'll see how it works. It, I just thought it was a little bit different and I was like, I didn't think they had done that in the past. So please, Correct me if I'm wrong about that, but I was like, that seemed like it was a pretty new thing. But we'll start off with the first game, the 435 game, Buffalo uh, um, Buffalo and Houston. And I think this one has has the makings to be a very low-scoring, back-and-forth kind of affair. I mean, for one thing, the Texans defense is definitely going to get a boost because J.J. Watt will be returning from his pec injury that's had him out for most of the season. And that'll be huge for them just as like it gives you, you can never have, in my opinion, you can never have too many pass rushers. So having J.J. Watt back will give him another pass rushing option. I mean, he's one of the best defensive players in the league when he's healthy. And hopefully, hopefully he'll, he'll be as healthy as he can be, at least at this point in the season, coming back from that injury. So that'll be, a, that's a big boost for them. Um, it sounds like Wolf Fuller may not play on the other side of the ball. Um, the receiver, Wolf Fuller, might not play. And if that's the case... Then that's that'll be big. It'll be interesting to see if he. I think that he'll be a game time decision. So if he can go, that's huge because that adds a complete another element for that Houston offense, and they're going to need it against a very, very stingy Bills defense. But yeah, he just gives them some deep speed. Um, forces if they if they choose to, Buffalo does force the safety to play over top of him. Make sure they can't beat him deep and open stuff up underneath for um, DeAndre and the uh, tight ends. Um, running backs out of the backfield. So not having him go, I mean, the offense is always worse without him on the field, so they would prefer to obviously have him on there. So if he if he can't go, that's big. But if he can, that's that's big in another way. So we'll have to see how how um, that works. And also, this will be, yeah, this will be Josh Allen's first playoff game. So um, he's not the only one this weekend that will be playing his first playoff game, but it'll be interesting to see how he handles that because – when it's more or less when the Bills when not when the Bills when Josh Allen plays well, the Bills normally win. In their in their wins this season, he has 15 touchdowns, six interceptions, 64 percent completion um, percentage, 7.4 yards per attempt, and a 95 96 quarterback rating. And in their losses, he only has five touchdowns to three interceptions, 48 percent completion percentage, and 5.5 yards per attempt, and a quarterback rating under 70. So if they get they get a good good Josh Allen game that could bode very well for the Bills because, like I said, their defense is stingy. They, they shouldn't – you never know in these games, but they shouldn't be giving up a lot of points. So if they can keep it low scoring, keep it close, Josh Allen should be able to do enough to keep um, to keep them around and potentially have them win the game. And that's just through the air, and that's not even counting for his legs, who he's 
Um, obviously, he's not Lamar, but he had more rushing touchdowns than him on the year, I believe. So he doesn't get all the yards, but in close situations, um, um, short distances near the red zone, they're going to use you're going to utilize his legs, and, and it'll be interesting to see how the Texans plan to stop that because he's a big guy, he's a tough guy, strong guy, it's hard to bring down. So it's going to take more than one guy just trying to make the tackle on him, and if they can't do that or they can't corral him in the pocket on on passing plays. The Texans could be in for a long night, but yeah. So um, that's that's from for Josh Allen, and then like I said, the Bills defense, one of the best in the league, second in points, third in yards. Um, they're very good on third down. So all those things would be very key because like in games like this, the little things, turnovers, scoring touchdowns in the red zone as opposed to kicking field goals, um, third down conversions or getting off the field on third down if you're on defense. Those are the kind of things that, that can help swing a game one way or the other. So the Bills are very good at third down, on third down, and as are the Texans on offense. So it'll be good to see how that how they, how they that matches up and see who has the edge there. Because, like I said, third down conversions, usually if you're converting a lot of your third downs, that means you're continuing drives, you're keeping the defense on the field longer, tiring them out. So that'll be very important on for the Texans to see if they're, they'll be able to do that but this is also a team that's very stingy through the air. So like I said, Will Fuller being out is definitely an issue um, just because the Bills defense is stingy as it is against um, um, receivers and and quarterbacks. So it, it'll be important to have as many games, I mean not as many games, as many players and weapons as the Texans can out there. But this will be a good one. Also, it'll be interesting to see how their, um, the Texans line holds up because as we know, um, Deshaun Watson, he's been pressured. He's been, um, he's he's been pressured a lot back there. He's been sacked a lot this year, um, and just being able to see if they are able to hold up against the Bills and their pass rush will be interesting. Because if they can keep Deshaun upright, give him time in the pocket, um, he, they they have a good shot to winning. I mean, Deshaun's another guy, much like Josh Allen, where he's very he's very up and down. So if he plays well, they usually have a very good chance of winning. If he doesn't play well, then they usually struggle. That's kind of just how it's been. And if you look at if you look at his games all over the um, across the season, if um, whenever not whenever, but he has one, two, three, four, five, seven games with the passer rating. Well, well, the quarterback rating. Well, yes, passer rating, same thing. A uh, quarterback rating over a hundred, and in those games, they are. I think the only game they lost was the Saints game. To begin the year, and that was again that wasn't completely his fault because he gave them the lead. They just allowed Drew Brees to drive down the field. So, and then he also has um, how many? One, two, three, four, five, six. No, well, yeah, so six. One, two, three, four. He has six games with a passer rating under uh, under eighty, and in most of those games, the uh, the team has struggled. I mean, they've won some of them, they've lost some of them. So the, the, it's not completely consistent in terms of the uh, result, but generally speaking, if he if he has a if he has a bad game, Texans are usually going to struggle because they because I mean um, I think no one of the games they won where he didn't play that well was the Bucks game, but I mean that was when Jameis was giving them a bunch of turnovers, and you can't count on that. I mean Josh Allen isn't imp- uh, isn't um, he's not a quarterback that's not going to turn the ball over, but he's not Jameis, so you can't count on that every game. So. Yeah, so this this will be going to probably be low scoring, keep it close. I mean, the Texans are at home, so like usually you try to give the edge to the home team, especially in the playoffs, especially against the guy who's starting his first game at, in, as a quarterback in the playoffs and Josh Allen on the road. But that defense for the Bills is great, so I wouldn't be surprised to get a couple turnovers, um, give Josh Allen some short fields, allow them the chance to get some easy points that way. But yeah, this one's going to be good. And the Titans New England matchup to end the night it could be. Just as good as not better. I think this is going to be sneaky. One of the best, the best game of the weekend, just because Ryan Tannehill, as surprising as it sounds, has been great since he took over for Mariota in Week Six. I mean, he's first in yards per attempt since Week Six, nine point six. Second in completion percentage at seventy point three. Third in quarterback rating at one seventeen point five. So it'll be interesting to see how they're able to stop him, and then if you if you do if you are able to stop him. Um, they also have to account for Derrick Henry um, running the ball as he was the league's leading rusher, over 1,500 yards. And I mean, that's just, 
I mean, it's just kind of like a pick your poison. Which one do you want to? Which one do you want to deal with? Because I mean, obviously their pass defense is great. They're, I mean, the Patriots defense overall is great, but the pass defense has been great. So you would think that the Tannehill may struggle a little bit, but if it, if he's able to do play action, if he's able to, if, because of Derrick Henry, Derrick Henry is able to run the ball efficiently and effectively throughout the game, then that'll make things easier for Tannehill, and thus maybe that Patriots defense will be able to be exploited a little bit. Obviously, I don't expect Tannehill to come in and throw um, put up forty on them, but like I said, that the Titans' offense is playing and has played very well since Tannehill took over. So it's not going to be an easy matchup for the Patriots. And also, the Patriots are a team, or are a defense, I should say, that has struggled against 12 and 13 personnel, which is two or three tight end sets. And the Titans run a lot of two tight ends, and, and no one in the league runs more three tight ends. So that's a situation where it could be a strength against a weakness in terms of if if the if the personnel grouping that the Patriots struggled with is the personnel grouping that Titans like to use a lot, that could very well be um, advantage Titans. And if that's the case, it could be it could be rough. It could be rough. And also another advantage is that the according to this is all according to Sharp Football, um, the Patriots are struggling at stopping runs to towards towards the right end, and the Titans are very good. They rank third at seven point yards, seven point one yards per play. On rushes on the right end, so that's another instance where you had a strength against a weakness for the Patriots, and that's something that I would assume the Titans know and would try to exploit. So if they're able to do that, that could be an issue, and especially like I said with Derrick Henry, the leading rusher, they can kind of play a ball control kind of um, style of offense. Even though the Patriots' offense hasn't been as explosive and as prolific as it is in the past, you still it's still Tom Brady. It's still in New England. You don't want to give um, Tom and the Patriots more chances than than, than they need as on the offense side. So if you can hold the ball for a long period of time, churn out 10, 11, 12 play drives, that could very well be to your benefit. And the Titans are a team that has been very good. Um, once they once they get towards the run zone, converting them into touchdowns, they average, I mean not average, they, have, um, they convert... Um, red zone trips and touchdowns seventy five percent of the time, and the pace in the past to Patriots defense, excuse me, is is very good at stopping teams from scoring touchdowns. They only give up touchdowns forty eight percent of the time. So that's another thing where it's going to be a, a strength. Well, this one is going to be a strength on a strength. So just to see how those two play out. But it's good. Like I said, it's going to be an interesting game. Tan Hill, though he's not with, though he never played them with the Titans. He's played. He's played in the AFC East before. So he's played against the Patriots. He knows somewhat to expect. Obviously, it's not exactly the same as the playoff game, so it's a little bit different. But he has an idea what to expect. And also, this is this this kind of game is uncharted territory for the Patriots. Now they haven't played in a wild card weekend in for years, and they never won a Super Bowl coming from uh, the um, though from from playing wild card weekend. So this this is an interesting start for the Patriots. Something they're not used to, and you hope that kind of that unfamiliar territory. I mean, they've been in the playoffs a lot, but the um, the unfamiliar territory of playing on wild card weekend doesn't doesn't get them to come out a little slow and a little unprepared against a team and a quarterback in the Titans that's right hot right now and is probably one of the teams that most people would not want to face. They had a choice. I mean, obviously, uh, you in the AFC you wouldn't want to play the Chiefs or the Ravens either. But the Titans are just up there in terms of how well the quarterback's playing. And you have a guy in Derrick Henry who's 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 big, physical, tough to bring down, and then it's going to be cold. It's going to be colder and. New England, so that's the that's the perfect type of game for a back like him. So those those would be great. And after this break, we're gonna we're gonna touch on the NFC side of things with two matchups that are very interesting in their own right and should provide. Like I said, it should be a great NFL weekend this upcoming weekend, Saturday and Sunday, having having games. But like I said, we'll touch on those NFC NFC games right after this.
Are you looking for the very best NFL and college football podcast? Then check out the GSMC Football Podcast. Get the latest football news both on and off the field. From the NFL draft to trades to the rumor mill to the NFL combines, they got you covered. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash football dash podcast. Get updates on college rivalries, game day insights, and much, much more. It's football talk the way you want it. This show eats, sleeps, and breathes football. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. AFC games, the NFC games, they first start with the 1 o'clock game of Saints in Minnesota, a rematch of sorts from the uh, Minneapolis Miracle game a couple years ago in the divisional round. Obviously, that one was in Minnesota. This one's in New Orleans. Quarterbacks are different. The teams are a little bit different. That team didn't have uh, Dalvin Cook, who should be back for this game, which is going to be a big boost for the Vikings, um, just because he's a dynamic running back who's he's one of the best running backs in the league. He was one of the best running backs in the league when he got hurt. And obviously they missed him a little bit just because he can bring a little more stability than guys like Amir Abdullah. And Boone can also, Alexander Madison, who was their number two running back who also was hurt, he should be back this week. So like I said, their, their rushing attack should be, um, should be intact. And that's important for a guy like um, Kirk who has struggled in these big-time matches, whether it's primetime games playoff games, um, t- play games against good teams, he's usually struggled. So having those two back that help take some um, take some pressure off of him so he doesn't have to feel like he needs to do everything himself, especially in a game where you're going to be in a hostile environment so you don't want to get down early. And you also don't want to give Drew Brees, much like, uh, much like you win Tom Brady and some of the other quarterbacks that are, that are in the playoffs this year, you don't want to give them more possessions than, than you have to. So you, this might be a game where... Um, Vikings may have to try to, much like the Titans, um, try to bleed the clock, um, go on long sustained drives, run the ball a lot and as effectively as they can. Just because you know, you know the Saints' offense is prolific. Even though I mean they don't really have a receiving threat outside of, um, oh, well outside of a receiver, like an actual receiver threat outside of Michael Thomas. But it hasn't mattered for Drew Brees and the and the Saints at all. Um, they've, they've gotten good play out of Jared Cook recently. I think, believe he has seven touchdowns in his last seven games. I mean, Drew Brees is fresh off of winning player of the month, 15 touchdowns in the month of December, I believe. And so he's, he's coming in hot. He's going to be in the dome. He's going to be fired up. They still feel like they, I feel like the Saints feel like they have a lot of unfinished business in that they could have, they were a miracle away in 2017 from possibly going to the Super Bowl. I mean, they would have gone to, um, Philly to play the Eagles in the NFC Championship game, and I think most people, will, based on how the Vikings game played out, you could say that um, the Saints would have put up much more of a fight than the Vikings did. And then last year, you have the well documented um, pass interference that wasn't called that has had some impact on this season, and may and pass interference not getting called may be what cost uh, the Saints a bye. Actually, in this, in this, in that uh, Seahawks Forty Nineers game, but that's neither here nor there. Um, but yeah, so the Saints, um, they definitely feel like they have some unfinished business. They're definitely, I feel like they're going to be a team that's on a mission, and they could start that mission by trying to put a beat down on the Vikings. Um, just, just set the tone, just to make sure everybody knows that hey, the Saints are going to be a team to be reckoned with. I mean, if depending on who you ask, people, people could say even though the three said they could be, they could very well be the best team in the NFC. So. This is a this is a game where um, I think the Saints could end up being just too much um, outside of just Kirk and himself. Obviously, it's not a one man team, but the Vikings as a whole are zero and four this season against ten win teams. So they are they are a team that has struggled against the better opponents they've played. I think they're 
you could say that they're probably their best win is against the Eagles um, in week around like week five, week six, where they 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 beat them thirty seven to twenty, I believe it was. But again, that that Eagles team is not the Eagles team that that is in the playoffs now. Who we get to in a couple minutes. But yeah, so the Vikings just have have struggled um, against the better teams. Though this will be the first time I believe Kirk has his offense at full strength in a very long time. I mean they've, I mean they missed Thielen for a while with the hamstring issue. Then they had Cook and Madison go down. So at least this time you have his full complement of weapons, which will be important because you're gonna have to put up points. So that like having everybody available to him will definitely help him, but. This is one of the situations where I think the Saints may very well be too much. Though, I mean, the um, I know Cam Jordan has said some interesting things about the Vikings recently. About how um, it didn't like them. And they're talking about Kirk and talking about the teams. And how the, this this is much different than when they last played. I mean, that team, I think I believe it, one of the quotes was that this team, uh, these are two different teams. And that was like five quarterbacks ago for the Vikings when they last played. And it's a good point. Kirk wasn't there. They had Case Keener for that game. And also, like I've, like I've mentioned earlier, and has been well documented, throughout Kirk Cousins' career, he's struggled to win that big game. So this this, this will be an opportunity for him to silence some doubters and silence some haters, if you will, and, and get a signature win against a very good team in a very tough environment. Obviously, winning in that dome was not easy for anybody, let alone a guy who struggled a little bit throughout his career in these kind of moments. But... This will be a big game. I mean, no one, a lot of people don't really think the Vikings are going to keep this close. I mean, like I said, if they can run the ball efficiently, um, they can do their play action. They can, Kirk is on. He's he's hitting Diggs. He's hitting Thielen. He's hitting Irv Smith Jr., the tight end. He's hitting Cook out of the backfield on the little screen pass they like to run. This game will be closer than people think. But I do think that home field advantage will probably be a part of the deciding factor. But like I said, I hope hopefully hopefully Kirk can silence me, can silence some of the other guys, and show up and show out in a big game because this would be big for him, win or lose. It'd be big for him, big for the team to have faith in him going forward into next season, and just big for like I said, big for his confidence. So that'll be so that'll be an interesting game to watch. And uh, a quarterback in the next game, Philly, um, the Philadelphia Eagles and Seattle Seahawks has um, Carson Wentz. He has another. He he much like Kirk has a chance to silence some of the doubts about him. I mean, coming to the season, he had a lot of doubts in terms of can he stay healthy? Can he lead a team to the playoffs? Can he elevate the players around him? Like like how people say Nick Foles did late in the season where he, where the defense played better, um, the receivers played better, everybody's having to play better, and can he win a playoff game? Now, he silenced most of those. He's, he stayed healthy. He's, he's played in key divisional games down the stretch of the season in December, won all of them. He's gotten this far with guys who, if you're not an Eagles fan, you may not have known of or heard of before a couple of weeks ago. And obviously every media outlet and every and previous shows made a point to mention that. But the, this getting this win, even if it's only one win, even though whatever happens, they go to San Francisco, they go to Green Bay next week and get, and get beat. Just getting this win will be big. To, to silence some of that um, Foles, um, just get that Foles monkey off his back. I mean, it's not exactly Steve Young, Joe Montana, like Super Bowl monkey, but um, this this would just be big for him. Just like that, that conversation can't really be had anymore, and you don't have to worry about that. I mean, obviously he's gonna in order to fully surpass Nick Foles, you have to win a Super Bowl. But just getting them, getting especially this team to that divisional round game, and whatever happens from there happens from there. Um, that would be good for him, and the Eagles are slightly lucky in that they are playing a team not as banged up as them, but still pretty banged up in their own right, in the Seahawks, who are down their top three running backs in Chris Carson, Rashard Penny, who had a great game against them the first time. I forgot to mention, this is a rematch from earlier in the season, which the Seahawks won. I don't say decisively, because they only won by eight, but it feel like the game shouldn't have been that close. I mean, they had then they got like four takeaways just on Carson Wentz alone. I believe I believe the Eagles might have had five turnover, turnovers in total in that game. So so the, like I said, I don't I don't expect that to happen again. But obviously these are teams that are familiar with each other. Russ is a guy who's never lost to the Eagles in his career. He's four and zero against them. 
But like I said, they're coming in banged up. Their their running situation is shaky. Um, their best offensive lineman, Dwayne Brown, is most likely not going to play this week. Though Jadavion Clowney should play, and he didn't play in the last game, so that'll be big. But I mean, like I said, the Eagles have their own injuries they have to deal with. Um, Zach Ertz could play, probably shouldn't play with the lacerated kidney, if that's really what it is. But, I mean, he's a tough guy. He's going to want to be out there. It's the class. Everybody's going to want to be out there. Lane Johnson, another guy who's missed who's missed um, most, if not all, of December, I believe, for them. So um, getting him back would be big, but there's no guarantee on that. Um, Miles Sanders will be another big one just because the Seahawks are a team that can be run on. And that'll be key for um, the Eagles to be able to run the ball effectively just because this takes some pressure off of, as we've said, the, they have pass catches out there that many of us hadn't heard of before, um, before, especially before season, but even before like their bye week in October, early November. But the the Seahawks run defense is 26th in DVOA, 22nd in yards per game, 28th in yards per attempt, uh, 30th in rush touchdowns, rushing touchdowns allowed. 26th in percentage of run plays resulting in a first down, and 23rd in run plays of 20 yards a lot, um, of 20 yards or more. So if the Eagles can establish the run, Jordan Howard should be back this game. I know he he technically was back for the Giants game, but he was only in for one play. So having him back and effective um, to complement Miles Sanders, who hopefully who they hope can play to complement Boston Scott, who's been who's been great down the stretch for them. I mean, running the ball, catching the ball. They also struggle um, with the Seahawks do with um, running backs out of the backfield. Uh, they are 29th in yards and 15th in receptions to running backs out of the backfield. And Boston Scott's been a um, he's been a huge guy out of the backfield for the Eagles as is Miles Sanders. So if all their running backs are healthy, that could be the key difference or one of the key differences to the game for the Eagles. On top of the fact that their defense, who is much maligned, especially on the outside. At the corner position, um, plays a lot better at home. They only give up around 17 points at home, as opposed to uh, as opposed to 29 on the road. So the fact that it's in Philly is big for them, just because, like they showed in the in the first Seahawks game, Russell Wilson was missing passes. He wasn't really comfortable back there. I believe he got sacked six times. So if their offensive line is even more banged up than it was then, that could that number could technically be higher. And if that's the case, then that all help mitigate some of the damage that their outside corners could do as the Eagles' defense has struggled against outside receivers there. 32nd in yards allowed, 29th in explosive receptions, which I believe is over 15 yards, but just they give up a lot of big plays. Um, they're 29th in touchdowns and 27th in yards per target. So if if Russ gets time back there, he's, um, he's going to be able to export some mismatches in the secondary, and that's what I would do if I'm the Seahawks. I mean, running, even Marshawn Lynch's, it was great. He had some good moments in the 49ers game. But the Eagles run defense, I believe, if it, I know it's top five, but I think it's third in the league, only giving like 90 yards a game. That's not really where I would attack them. The secondary and in, in, in the air is where I would attack them, and I think that's where the Seahawks will attack them. But, I mean, you, you, it's hard to say just because the Seahawks are a team that likes to establish the run, though I think this is a game where I don't think the weather's supposed to be that bad, so this is not the game I would try to establish the run. So when I go home, so... I'm going to do whatever I think gets give me a better chance of winning. And against the Eagles, most teams have had success passing the ball through the air. So if they can find ways to give Russ some time, he should be able to attack um, the weaknesses in that Eagles secondary. And if he can and doesn't miss some of those, I know they had a couple drops and he had a couple missed throws in that first game where they could have had more than 17 points, then th- this is going to be one where it could be a little tough for the Eagles because getting more than – even though they've they've done well with these with this mismatch of, of practice squad and, and random receivers and running backs out there, they've they've had over 400 yards, I believe, their last four games. They had no issues scoring into the 20s outside of the Cowboys game, so they they shouldn't have too much issues scoring. But at the same time, you don't want to have to rely on and getting a shootout with Russell Wilson. I mean, he's one of the best quarterbacks in the league, probably second in MVP voting this year to Lamar. So that's that's just not what I would. That's not the plan I would have to try to get in a shootout with, 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 with get in a shootout with Russell Wilson. That's not what I would do if I were the Eagles. I would try to do their ball control, run the ball, pound pounded with um their three headed. I don't say monster, but their three headed backfield 
that they have, assuming Sanders can go and is and is effective, and just keep Russell Wilson off the field as much as possible. And I think if they can do that, then the Eagles have a chance. Like I said, they're at home, so that probably gives them the edge. But you just wonder if this will be the game where the injuries finally catch up with them. Because eventually, you would think it's going to catch up with them. I mean, you never know. They went on a magical Super Bowl run not that long ago, so it, who am I to say that they can't do it again? But you would just think at some point the injury is going to catch up, and you just hope it is not. Um, you hope for if you're an Eagles fan, you hope it's not this week. But yeah, that one's going to be another close game. The Seahawks basically always play close games, so I don't expect um, them to blow the Eagles out at all. So, like I said, that should be a good one. All these games should be good, I believe. And yeah, it should, it should be a fun weekend. So I would just advise you all to make sure you got a nice spot on the couch. If you're, if you're not at home, make sure you're at a restaurant with some TVs because you're not going to want to miss any of these games. So, coming up next, we'll talk about some of the some of the last bowl games that were played in the finish up the New Year's Six Bowls and a couple other bowl games that happened on the beginning of the new year that were, I mean, there was full sighted games and they were all, they were all really good. So we'll touch on those right after this break. Check out the show that's built on the MMA. From the UFC to extreme cage fighting, they got the fights covered. Check out the GSMC MMA podcast. Get the latest news on past or upcoming fights. Join us as we talk to and about some of the biggest names in the MMA, past, present, and future. When it's the fight game, there's just one show to check out. GSMCpodcast.com backslash MMA dash podcast. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit G. SMCpodcast.com for more info. on the GSMC Sports Podcast and by GSMC Podcast Network. And the first of the New Year's Six Bowl games that went down on New Year's Day, first games of the first games of the year, well, no, technically one of the last games of the year, but first for one of the first football games in the new year was the Rose Bowl game between Oregon and Wisconsin. And this game was everything we could have hoped for, everything we would have wanted. Close game down to the wire between two very good teams. And um, I, f- I, I feel bad for that Wisconsin defense because that defense came to play. I said in um, the preview pod for this game on it came out Wednesday that um, it was going to be big for both these teams to stop the run. Um, for Oregon, C.J. Verdell had was coming off a great game in the Pac-12 championship game, and um, Wisconsin for Wisconsin, Jonathan Taylor is obviously one of the best running backs in the league. So I mean, country. Sorry, not the league. Best running backs in the country. And so stopping him for Oregon would be paramount. And Wisconsin did a great job of shutting down that Oregon offense. I mean, in total, they only had, what, they only had 200 total yards, 100, only 138 through the air, 66 on the ground. But the issue was that they did not account for Justin Herbert being a threat out of the backfield. And, I mean, it's hard to blame them because I coming into that, I mean, including that game, on the season, uh, I don't think Justin Herbert has 60 rush attempts. So it's not that he was the guy that they used a lot during the season. And, I mean, it's interesting that they decided to wait until this game to break out more of those zone read, some of those option plays that a lot of other teams utilize um, with their quarterbacks. But, yeah, Justin Herbert, that, he was just a guy that didn't really, that wasn't really asked to do that. Clearly, he's more than capable, as he showed with three rushing touchdowns in that game. But it's just interesting that they chose so long to wait to use it. And I mean, like obviously, it worked for them. They they, they, they were able to get the win. Like I said, Justin Herbert was able to run for three touchdowns, and including a 30-yard touchdown um, that to give them the lead um, midway through, like seven minutes left in the fourth quarter for good. But, just, uh, but it was just interesting that that was how they were able to um, attack that Wisconsin defense and that it was so effective just because 
Um, that was not something I imagine Wisconsin planned a lot for. Obviously, like I said, Herbert is very capable of doing that, but it was just not something he had done much throughout the year. So it was not something you go you would expect to go into the game to game and go into the game game planning for. But clearly, it was something that Oregon wanted to do, and it worked. So yeah, I mean, the game all game was a uh, back and forth. I mean, Oregon goes down. Uh, right down the field, uh, 12 plays, 75 yards, touchdown, and, and you're like, you know, well, okay. the touchdown was a four-yard Herbert run, and you're like, oh, wow, it was, it was Wisconsin. Couldn't be able to keep up with the physicality and the speed of Oregon. And, I mean, they um, showed speed of their own as the ensuing kickoff was taking 95 yards for a touchdown. So, once again, right back, right back tied up. Um, Wisconsin was like, all right, we're we're coming here to play. We're not we're not just gonna come here and get rolled over on. And the I mean the next play after, well the next offensive play for game after that after the, the kickoff was um, an interception thrown by Justin Herbert. Wisconsin gets good field position, but the defense is able to hold um, for Oregon. They only they only uh, they forced them to a field goal attempt. But I mean that's one of those things where um, if Wisconsin's a running team, so if they ever get behind the sticks, it's gonna be tough for them to consistently get out of that and they weren't able to do it there then then um then it went back and forth a little bit with some punts um Wisconsin missed the field goal uh in there as well so the the score stayed 10-7 for a while I mean neither team could really get much going offensively um and then the one of the turning points you could say of the game was um an interception while Wisconsin was up 10-7 interception thrown by Jack Cohn to Thomas Graham Jr., who's able to turn in 24 yards. And then in three plays, um, Oregon goes down, scores a touchdown, another another um, uh, Herbert run. Like I said, three plays. First play, Juwan Johnson for 15 yards, then a C.J. Verdell run, 13 yards, and boom, they're in the end zone. But, I mean, Wisconsin was not going to go away quietly. They were able to drive down the fields, uh, eight plays, 53 yards, and get a touchdown to uh, Cephas, 11-yard touchdown right before um, the end of the half there to give them the lead. And you're like, all right, okay, we got ourselves a game here. Going into the half, you you didn't really know um, how the second half was going to play out. And then um, another turning point, I mean, like I said, the I, I believe, yeah, I believe Wisconsin had four turnovers in this game, and um, in total, Oregon scored 21 points off those four turnovers. And... The um, and one, another one of their big turnovers came right at the beginning of the of second half, where um, the um, Oregon forces a punt, and then the punter just inexplicably just drops the ball. Brady Breeze for Oregon picks it up, runs 31 yards in for a touchdown. I mean, that, that is not the last time you're gonna hear his name, as he had another big play later on. But yeah, so then that was that was big, just because like um, just because as we've talked about, the Oregon offense was struggling, so. Punting, pinning them back, would have would have been would have been big for Wisconsin just because then they could have got the ball in good field position. And instead, Oregon runs in for a touchdown. So, on that hurt. But then, on um, Wisconsin once again. I mean, the, like I said, this game was back and forth all night. So they weren't going to go away without a fight. They were able to drive down the field on their next drive, um, score a touchdown, put them up twenty four twenty one. Then, um, then again, Oregon can't do anything. Three and out. Wisconsin drives down, gets the field goal, another punt for Oregon after six plays, and then, and then the ensuing drive, Brady Breeze comes up with another big play, where he forces a, a fumble on like a, they try to run a little, jet sweep play. Wisconsin did. Brady Breeze put a nice hit right on the ball. The ball pops out. Oregon recovers first, and the the next play uh, was a thirty yard touchdown run by Justin Herbert to put them up for good. And. Uh, and yeah, I mean that was that was basically about it. I mean, uh, Wisconsin punted, then Oregon had to punt the ball back to Wisconsin. Then Wisconsin goes uh, three plays, negative ten yards after offensive pass interference was called. It was a little ticky tacky, but um, unfortunately, it's just one of those things where all these ref calls are just su- subjective. So I'm kind of stuck in a rock and a hard place with that, but. Yeah, they then they had to punt the ball back, and, they, and then Oregon was able to bleed out the clock, and they were, were able to finish it. They got a couple first downs, and then that was it. Basically, the last one uh, being a 28-yard pass on a quick little the quick little pass out to Juwan Johnson. The corner was playing off. He just broke a tackle, and then 
boom, he ran 28 yards, got out of bounds, and they were able to take knees from there. And uh, that was it. I mean, and that's, I mean, in the Rose Bowl game, a game of that magnitude, you're all you're hoping for is a close competitive game between two very good uh, schools, and that's exactly what we got. It's a nice way for Justin Herbert to finish off his career. Um, he's he's an Oregon guy, so they able to bring them back to some level of national prominence, win the Rose Bowl for them in his last game. It was big for him, and obviously this will be the last thing people will see, and it'll be a nice showcase for him just because you can. he was able to show off another side of him in terms of skills he may have at the next level. This is going to be a guy that's going to get drafted. So, like I said, that was a great game, and uh, the later game, the night game, was uh, Georgia-Baylor. And that game was another showcase game. I mean, there was... This 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 day had showcase games for and, and all of them, but th- this was uh, another showcase game for a receiver. We'll get on the two bigger performances from earlier in the day in the next segment. But this one, uh, freshman George Pickens for Georgia had himself a game. I mean, he had 12 receptions, 175 yards, and a touchdown. I mean, Jake Fryer only threw for 250, so that's only 75 yards for everybody else on the team. And, yeah, he was just... He was just a one-man wrecking crew. The Bear didn't really have much of an answer for him uh, most of the night, and uh, that's the kind of and as we saw in some of the other, in the earlier games, when you have one guy that's just um, just clearly better than whoever's lining up against them, you throw it to him whenever you can, and he usually goes and make a play, and that's that's really the difference. I mean, this game was another game like like most of these games have been. It was close for a while. I mean, it was it was zero zero for most of the. For most of the first quarter, if not all of the first quarter. Oh, yeah, you know, most of the first quarter. Yeah, because yeah, uh, Georgia kicked the field goal a little bit before the quarter ended. But, yeah, so, I mean, the, the Bale was playing good defense. They were able to hold the Georgia offense down for a little while. Obviously, Georgia was playing without a lot of their players. I believe they had 12 regular guys, whether it's starters or key contributors, that didn't play in this game, whether due to injuries or focusing on the draft or whatever reason. So it was a different Georgia team than than most other teams had faced throughout the season. But still in that, they were able to take a nice, comfortable 19-point uh, lead in the halftime with a couple, uh, like I said, they had the field goal, then a touchdown, then then another field goal, and then a touchdown there with little time left in the half um, to, to give them the 19th lead going in the halftime. And you're just like, oh, okay, let's see what Baylor can do coming out of the half. And they did. They drove right down the field, scored. So, like I said, another situation where the team's not going to lay down. Like like, um, like we talked about on the last spot, this could have been Matt Rule's last game. I mean, he's getting head coaching interviews at the NFL level. So this, could, this very well could have been his last game. So he wasn't going to have his guys go out there and get embarrassed. And that's obviously what Baylor, what Baylor was trying to do. And, and they didn't to a degree. I mean, they scored a touchdown, forced a punt. And unfortunately, they fumbled uh, on a sack. Uh, Charlie Brewer was sacked, and he was stripped. And then uh, George was able to recover the fumble, and then they were able to take it in for a touchdown, 26-7, uh, to, to give them the lead. And that was on a touchdown run by Zamir White. And that was basically it. I mean, Baylor came down the field, scored again. Um, but then the, uh, they weren't really able to do much after that. Uh, and neither was uh, Georgia, for that matter. They punted basically the rest of the game until they had to take some kneels and some kneel downs that day at the end. But um, unfortunately, like I said, Georgia um, Baylor was just able to, wasn't able to do anything. They had a chance late, but uh, Charlie Brewer got knocked out um, after an, um, he got tackled on the sideline, hit his head. He was already suffered a concussion in the Big Twelve Championship game, so they were definitely extra cautious with him. This one supposedly from Matt Rule wasn't as bad, but still, it's just. Anything with head injuries and players, you're going to be extra cautious, especially nowadays. So then they had um, Zeno come in, who who lit it up, had two touchdowns and two passes in the Big 12 championship game, but he just wasn't able to get that same sort of momentum going in this one, which was unfortunate for Baylor as he came in and they couldn't really do much. He got sacked on 4th and 11, and that was basically the game. And then the next drive, he... He threw an interception, but like I said, at that point, they were, they were, they were fighting up against the clock. So, they still had a shot, but it was just one of those things where it was gonna, it was a last just effort, and Baylor just wasn't able to get it done. But, yeah, that, I mean, those two games, um, good, great win for Georgia, just because, like I said, they were down a lot of guys. They lost in the Sugar Bowl last year. Um, and it was just, it would be just big for them to get, to get that right and get, and get, to finish the season off on a good note. 
and possibly finish off Jake Fromm's career on a good note. We're going to talk a little bit about guys declaring and not declaring, but he's a guy that has a big um, uh, decision ahead of him. DeAndre Swift has a big decision ahead of him. Obviously, a couple of their guys, a couple of their linemen are already, were already sitting out of this game for uh, to work on their uh, – to help start the training for the draft. So um, it's clear that the draft was a – was a, it was a theme with that Georgia team just in, in terms of helping guys make their decisions. But all in all, they played a good game. Baylor just didn't have enough there, especially once the Charlie Brewer went out. It was it, there wasn't they, they couldn't recapture that same magic as you know had in the Big Twelve Championship game. But I mean, not to be outdone by some of these by the two earlier games, Michigan, Alabama, and Minnesota, Auburn. Both of those were great. Both of those had great performances from wide receivers, much like this game had with George Pickens. And we was touch on those. Right after this break. Are you looking for help for your fantasy football team? Check out the GSMC Fantasy Football Podcast. Get today's best advice on who to start, who to sit, even who you should draft. From sleeper picks to red hot lineups, they got it all covered for you. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash fantasy dash football dash podcast. We'll cover traditional leagues, dynasty, PPR, even IDP leagues. When you need fantasy help, there's just one show to hit up. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow Follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. SMC Sports Pod. So the first game I'm going to talk about is the Alabama Michigan game. And I mean, if that's the last game of Jerry Judy's career, I mean, what a way to go. I mean, first play of the game, guy goes 85 yards, single coverage, post route, touchdown. I mean, I don't know why anybody would single cover arguably best receiver in college football. But that's what Michigan decided to do. Unfortunately for them, did not work out how they would have liked. And, I mean, from there, I mean, Alabama just kept it rolling. I mean, it didn't matter. Even um, even though they didn't have two in there, I mean, Mac Jones was still was still great. Three, 300, 327 yards, three touchdowns. Like I said, uh, Jerry Judy had the one touchdown, but he had six catches for 204 yards. Um, an Alabama bowl record that had lasted for over 50 years. Yeah, because the 67 was the record when it was when the record was set in the Sugar Bowl. By Ray Perkins, and that's when he, and then that's the record that Henry, um, not Henry Ruggs, uh, Jerry Judy broke. So that was a great day for him. Speaking of Henry Ruggs, um, he left the game with a concussion, so he should be fine. But that's as we talked about already on this um, a couple episodes back. We just like people decide to sit out. I'm always I'm always for players sitting out just because you never know what happens. Luckily, there weren't too many big 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 time injuries in the bowl games, but you never it's you never know. It's too dangerous in my opinion if you're not playing in the national championship game. So, luckily Henry Ruggs didn't have anything serious. He's a guy again, much like Judy, much like Devontae Smith, much like Tua, that have big decisions ahead of them in terms of if they're going to go out and go into the draft or not. So, you don't want to see anything happen to them and in what could potentially be their last game, but it did, they didn't really need him that much. Uh, in all honesty, um, he only he only had two catches for 27 yards. But when you have a guy go for six and 204, um, there's not really there's not really much else. Many of the other guys need to do, and then um, that defense um, was able to stifle Michigan. Well, especially in the the first half, they they did they the Michigan did a better job moving the ball. But in the second half, they really just couldn't do much of anything. Unfortunately for them, like I talked about in the last podcast, this, this could have been a chance for a big signature win to cap off the year um, for Harbaugh. To a degree, obviously, the Citrus Bowl isn't necessarily the biggest game, but it still would have been a big win against Alabama, a team that no matter who or when you're playing, when when and where you're playing them, I should say, they're always going to be a tough team to beat. So that would have been a, that would have been a big win, help get some momentum going for next season. For Michigan and Harbaugh, but unfortunately they weren't able to do that. I mean, the game was close in the beginning. 
Um, obviously, the as we talked about, the Mich- uh, Alabama had the one play touchdown. He had a couple punts back there, but Michigan's able to get the ball back, drive down the field. Sam plays 85 yards. Shea Patterson touchdown pass. Um, they were able to then get another stop and then kick a field goal on their next drive, go up 10-7. Got another field goal, go up 13-7. But then uh, Mac Jones, that offense, drives down the field, eight plays, 75 yards this time, capped off by Najee Harris run, who was also great in this game. I believe he had he had over 100 yards, 136, two touchdowns, 24, 24 carries. He was another guy who was great in this one. Um, but yes, they were, they were able to take the able to um, um, take the lead towards the end of the half, but then Michigan was able to drive down the field. They were able to get a 57-yard uh, field goal from Quinn Dorn in the half, which was which I think was a record. But yeah, it was big. He was three for three on the day. It was one of their more I don't want to say clutch, but just one of their better players was the kicker. And he, I mean, now it's a 57-yard field goal. That's not even guaranteeing the NFL. So a college kicker doing that. It was all the more impressive. But then you come out after the half, you get a four play, 75 yards. Uh, Mac Jones this time to Devontae Smith. And then uh, Michigan, just from there, couldn't really do much of anything. Just a bunch of punts, interception by Shea Patterson. It was it was basically over from that point on, unfortunately, for Michigan. But, I mean, this is kind of oh, a thing you feared. I mean, they, there were multiple times where they allowed, uh, uh, you know, Alabama, I think Alabama had what? One, one, two, three, three touchdown drives of five plays or less. So when you're just, I mean, obviously Alabama's explosive have weapons all over the place, but when you're allowing the team to go down the field that quickly and score, I mean, it's hard. It's hard. Um, it's hard for your defense and hard for your offense to get things together because you don't even have that much time on the sideline to help game plan for what you have next. But yeah, it's just an, it's unfortunate to end to Michigan season. For them, obviously, Alabama, great, great winner. Just hand it off, even though just showing that as long as you got those receivers out there, whoever's, no, nah, I won't say whoever's playing quarterback, because obviously two is better than Mac Jones, but they have, the, this is um, this kind of scenario where you have a you have your quarterback go down and your offense doesn't really miss too much of a beat. is not something that Alabama had the luxury of having in the past. They didn't have these kind of weapons, both um, out wide and in the backfield, or the quarterback play wasn't at this level. So, even with some guys um, skipping out on defense, um, the bowl game it didn't really didn't really make a difference. Alabama still did what Alabama does, and that's win games and win them pretty easily. As they finished off the thirty-five sixteen, like I said, unfortunate end for Michigan season. But at least their Big Ten brethren in Minnesota was able to pick them up as they were able to get the victory over Auburn. At the same, yeah, these games are going on at the same time. That was that was kind of fun, just trying to go back and forth, trying to keep up with all the action because there was just so much going on. But this game, Minnesota, another game with another great wide receiver performance. This this one by Tyler Johnson, who had 12 catches, 204 yards, two touchdowns, including one sick, I mean, absolutely amazing one-handed catch in the back of the end zone by Tanner Morgan. Then obviously the, the other one was a long long post route, another guy, single coverage, and if you have all that space and you run a night route and the quarterback puts a good ball on you, I mean, it's it's a touchdown most times as long as you don't get caught, and Tyler Johnson was not getting caught, at least not on this day. And so, yeah, he had a great game. Um, he's, a, one of the, he's the less heralded of the two receivers. I mean, obviously, Bateman is the guy that gets a lot of the glory and uh, name recognition and some of the accolades, but Tyler Johnson, the senior, last game of his career, and he, he's another guy that put on a show to end his, to end his career. And that's, I mean, that's all you kind of hope for in these games. You either hope that, from your team's perspective, if you're rooting for a specific team, you either hope you're, A, your young guys play good so they have confidence going to next year, or B, your, your older guys, your seniors, your juniors that are going to declare for the draft, go out and show out and put on a good performance to end, the, to end their careers. And that's exactly what Tyler Johnson did. He, he was more or less unstoppable out there. And... and, and it did to a degree. I mean, the Auburn defense did not have much answers for him as a whole, but it didn't start off too, too well for Auburn. I mean, for Minnesota, I mean, they were able to get the win in there at the end. They started off first drive interception. Then, I mean, their defense was able to hold, they forced a field goal. Then they, then they, Minnesota was able to drive down, kick a field goal of their own in the first play right after that. 
Uh, nine, I believe it was 96 yards. Yeah, 96 yard touchdown on a kickoff. Interesting. Um, we had quite a few kickoffs um, return for touchdown to, um, on New Year's Day, which is which is not something that normally happens, but happened in those games. And then, and then the next drive, Minnesota fumbles. Uh, yeah, Minnesota fumbles. Um, fumbles the punt. No, no, no. I take that back. Excuse me. Auburn fumbled the punt. I forget that that's my mistake. They punched it away. They fumbled it. Minnesota got the ball back, and then they were able to run it in. Ibrahim, who another guy, much like Ty Johnson, had a great game. Uh, to 20 carries, 140 yards, and a touchdown. So this was his one touchdown to give uh, to help tie the score up at 10. And then that's what it was for most of the second um, second quarter until Minnesota was able to put a drive together. This one was capped off by the fourth down. It was a big, it was a big play and big decision. I mean, they had, they had tried. A couple times from the yeah they started they got first and goal from the Auburn to try to pass for one yard then they ran up the middle for no gain um, they got twelve men on the field and they tried to run up then tried to run up the middle again for no gain I mean the best the best part of the Auburn defense is their defensive line so it's, it was going to be tough to move those guys especially when guys like Derek Brown aren't sitting out this game so it was going to be tough for them but then they were able to ran a little trick play on fourth down able to get they had their Wildcat quarterback in. I believe, and they were able to get the fourth down um, conversion. Nice little one yard pass, and that was a, uh, and that was a key one, as it as, as it helped them get the lead seventeen ten. But then um, Auburn was able to go down the field, go right back, score um, before the end of the half to tie it up. Well, not before the end of the half, but um, late in that second quarter. The title of seventeen seventeen, and then oh, Minnesota just drove right down the field again. Nine plays, seventy five yards. Touchdown. This one was the t- capped off by Ty Johnson, uh, one handed catch in the back of the end zone. I mean, it was a sensational catch, absolutely sensational. Um, easily like one of those like like ESPN like top ten sports center like top catches like one of those that you see. That that's what it was. If you didn't see it, go check it out. It was great. Um, but yes, they take a seven point lead heading into the half. Auburn is able to, on the second possession of the second half, able to go 13 plays, 86 yards, a um, couple nice couple nice plays, a couple nice catches um, on the drive, and they were able to get a Whitlow touchdown to tie the game up at 24. And then from there, it was very back and forth on defense. On um, the Auburn defense forces a punt, and Minnesota defense is able to get a stop on fourth down. Uh, then... Minnesota fumbles. Then um, after the stop, um, Auburn can't really do much with it. And then they give the ball back. And then there was one play, 73-yard post touchdown to Ty Johnson. Give um, give uh, give Minnesota the lead for good. Uh, Auburn got the ball back, was forced to punt, and then uh, Minnesota was able to bleed the clock out the rest of the game, which was, I mean, huge. It was, I mean, 16 play, 68 yards, turn out the final eight. Almost nine minutes of the game. Just a very impressive drive, and this is a very impressive season for Minnesota. Who not many people talked about coming to the season, being good in the Big Ten, but finished with eleven wins. Um, finished with eleven wins, and a lot of their guys are coming back. Their quarterback's only a sophomore. Their, their quote unquote best receiver and Bateman's only a sophomore. Ibrahim, their running back's only a sophomore. So they're going to be. I mean, they lose Tyler Johnson and they lose their offensive coordinator. So we'll see how that change. Affects things, but they're going to be a team that's not going to be an easy out in that uh, Big Ten. I believe, they're, yeah, they're in the Big Ten West, so just not going to be easy out in that um, Big Ten West. And I know, um, I mean, they got. I mean, Wisconsin's always good, but they're going to have to see how Jonathan Taylor, who will, what happens with um, if Jonathan Taylor leaves, how their offense looks. Then I was always decent in the competitive Illinois might be on the come up so it's going to that Big Ten West is going to be competitive but I mean coming into the next season you have to believe Minnesota is going to be the team to beat based on how this season went for them and who they have coming back again next year and maybe ready to step up with, to replace some of the guys that do leave but yeah those I mean all those games are great and in all those games you have um, you have players who either have already made the decision in terms of they sat out the bowl game or getting ready to make the decision with the bowl game starting to wind down. You have more guys declaring, announcing where they're going to stay or where they're going to go. And the next segment we'll talk about just how big of a decision that is and, and some of the some of the big guys who have either made a decision 
or have yet to make a decision on what that could mean for their teams and for the NFL and college football as a whole. So, like I said, we'll talk about that right after this break. Are you looking to get your college football fix? Looking to get the latest news on your favorite school's team? The GSMC College Football Podcast is your ticket to all things college football. Join us as we talk college football from the national championship, the college rivalries, the bowl game, to the Heisman Trophy, to which conference is the best. We've got you covered for the Big Ten, SEC, Big 12, the Pac-12, ACC, and everything in between. Download the GSMC College Football Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. And we are back here once again on the GSMC Sports Podcast. So, one of the big names left to still decide on what he's doing is Tua Tungavailoa. And this is a guy who whose decision could very well shape college football and the NFL in this coming season. Well, this upcoming season. And, and, and for the NFL in this draft. Just because if he doesn't come out, then there's really just Jura Burrow, or Burrow in terms of guys that you would definitely take at the top of the draft. And even if he does come out, he says the injury concern. So his decision is going to be big. And just all the decisions are very big for you know, the player, for their families, and for their schools. Just because mm, this decision could very well be millions and millions of dollars worth of decision. Which is why people try to get as much information as they can before making this decision because if you have a guy that comes out early, earlier than he should, um, he can either A, um, not be as good in the NFL, maybe kind of like, I don't want to say Quinn and Williams like, made a wrong decision, but because he went top three, I mean, the, the anytime you're a top five pick, you have to leave. But he basically only played one year of college football and this year, you kind of had a subpar season with the Jets. I mean, something that was due to injury, but it's just like you wonder if he could use an extra year. But he's a guy that probably doesn't question his decision just because he was able to be a top five pick. But there's other guys who have been thought of to be top of their class that maybe that maybe either either decide to come back and hurt their draft stock. I mean, very rarely do people help their draft stock. Like Justin Herbert last year, if he goes. If he leaves, if he leaves college, he's probably um, one of, if not the first quarterback off the board. And now this year, he could be. He's at best the second if Tua doesn't come out, and probably even the third, even if Tua, even if Tua does come out with the injury uh, with the injuries. So it's just one of those things where like that that drop from maybe like a top five pick to like fifteen twenty, even late first, even later in the first round. That's millions and millions of dollars worth. Of money that that guy lost, so that's why these decisions are always big for all these guys. And you can you can just and just and I'll never you never want to like um, obviously you don't want the schools pressuring guys or forcing them to make a decision one way or the other, or, fa- or their families forcing them to make a decision one way or the other. Because again, these are huge decisions. And there's also guys every year that come out and they think they're going to go in the second, third round. They end up going fifth, sixth, seventh, maybe even undrafted. And you're just like, oh, but by then it's too late. You're just like, oh, I can't go back. I can't go back to school. But now you're under the free agent. You're not really making that much money. You could have maybe gone back to school, help your draft stock kind of thing. And I know Nick Saban's a guy that talks about that a lot in terms of he doesn't like when guys leave leave um, early if they're not top picks. And I mean, I know he made the point of saying that only player, only the only Alabama player that he got back, at least from whoever he talked to, that was going to be a top 15 pick for sure was Tua. Which is funny because I mean you have Jerry Judy, who's one of well, definitely one of, but in many people's eyes, the best receiver coming out this year. So I find it hard to believe that he, at the very least, didn't also have a top fifteen um, draft uh, uh, ranking or projection. But I mean, Sam's always going to always going to say he always wants his guys to come back as much as they can 
and obviously you got that earlier today with Alex Leatherwood decided he was going to come back for his senior year. But you have a lot of these decisions. A guy like KJ Hamler just declared, and he's a guy who is probably he's 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 shorter. He's five nine, maybe not really that big. He's a guy that like could he have come back for his, for another year? Yes, but like how much is he going to help his draft stock next year? I mean, this year there's great receivers coming out. Next year there's still going to be great receivers coming out. So it's one of those things where he's not going to be like, unless unless he hits a growth spurt, he's going to be five nine again when he comes out next year. So it's like, what good does it do for him? Even though he may not be a guy that's going to go in the top fifteen, top twenty of the draft, is is he going to drop? Is him going back potentially getting hurt? Potentially having another bad year? Could that potentially drop him from a second round pick to like a fourth or fifth round pick? And then again, that's a lot of money the players lost out on. So you got so all these decisions are very difficult, and that's why. The decision with Dylan Moses, another guy who claimed he was going to come back, but then earlier today, his um, his father, who runs a law firm, put out a statement talking about how they actually haven't. He hasn't fully made a decision. He's going to reevaluate and get back and make the announcement on the twentieth twentieth of January, which I believe is the last day they can officially declare. Just because he he had um he had another put out a, a statement and he he attained a loss of value draft position. Project protection all on his own after receiving a mid first round grades projection in the, in the spring or the spring. So basically, I think that I'm pretty sure what that means is just that he um the, the so he got he got a talent evaluation. People had talked about where they thought he would go, and then in case he got hurt or whatever, he 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 had some protection for himself. And like I said, in case he he got hurt and lost money due to due to injury or, or and falling in the draft. But then so then he obviously does end up um, sustaining a knee injury in the fall, and after the completion of the 2019 NCAA football season, the same advisory committee um, issued Moses a second round grade, which is obviously a loss of value, which is why you get that um, protection. And we and he they decided they were investigating um, whether he has a claim for the lost value with his insurance company, meaning that like he would get some of the money back that he loses by if he fell to second round because of his knee injury, which isn't necessarily his fault, but just like, it's a good, it's good for the player just in case. Cause you, you never know when you go back to school or you just get an injury. If you were going to be a high pick and you can't come out to your junior year and you get injured during that junior year and you end up dropping the draft, it's, it's a nice way for them to help make up some of that money that you low, you lose out on. So he's another one. That's why these decisions of why guys do decide to go pro or don't decide to go pro are so difficult because of things like this, where you have a guy who maybe this year, who maybe this year is projected to be a second round pick, and all right, he decides, all right, I want to boost that up to a first round pick. Makes sense. He comes back, and then he gets hurt, and then now he drops from a second round pick to a fourth round pick, maybe, or maybe he gets a medical veteran, comes back again for a fifth year, but now instead of coming out at twenty one, he's coming out at like twenty three, twenty four. And then, like, th- that's a big deal because like, if you come into the league as a rookie at, like, 23 or 24 years old, that you're already, like, an old man in the eyes of the, in the league in terms of a newcomer because they're wanting younger guys, fresher guys. So that, that kind of thing could definitely damage a player. And then, obviously, in terms of with the loss of value um, insurance that these guys have, you lose out on the money that you would have gotten had you got drafted higher. So there's there's a lot. I mean, there's a, there's going to be a lot to unpack, especially with Tua's decision because he's probably the, the biggest name out there still left to declare. I mean, you've had guys like C.D. Lamb already declare. You've had guys... Yeah, C.D. Lamb's a big one. Um, you have um, another guy from Penn State, uh, Itar Grossmatos, Grossmatos, um, Jordan Love, an uh, uh, interesting quarterback prospect who's not necessarily um, at the top of draft boards but could climb up with um, a good, good workouts. And Jeffrey Okuda, the arguably the best corner coming out this year, decide to declare. So you see, you got a, you see a lot of guys already declaring. The Visca Chenault, or see out of Colorado, another one of the top receivers coming out. Andrew Thomas, arguably the top tackle coming out of Georgia, who sat out his bowl game, as we touched on. But then, like like I said, you have guys that like Alex Leatherwood coming back. You had guys like potentially Dylan Moses, potentially even Tua coming back. Um, C.J. Verdell from Oregon coming back, who he could have left as a retro sophomore. A guy like Talon Wiles, who tore his ACL, who decides he's going to come back to school, even though he was he was probably going to be like a second, third round pick. So hopefully he can 
gain some of that draft stock back so he can rise himself up into that first round, maybe even in the second. But, yeah, I mean, this... I never... I, I would never begrudge a college athlete in terms of making this decision because this is arguably the biggest decision ne- next to where you decide to go to college. is probably the biggest decision of your life just because there's potentially millions and millions of dollars on the line if you make the wrong decision, whatever that is, whether that's to come out early, whether that's to stay an extra year. So it's always... It's it's all I'm always I'm always been a uh, an advocate for a leave as early as you can to get make sure you get money because you're not getting paid in college football and you much rather get hurt while you're getting paid than get hurt while you're making nothing and then lose the chance of potentially making money. At the same time, I can see why some of these guys come back. They want to make as much money as they can and rise their draft stock as much as they can. But then it's just all it's it's all a tough 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 decision. So um, there will we'll have more to talk about in terms of, like I said the deadline's the twentieth so. As that continues to go on, we'll have we'll have a lot. We'll be monitoring the Tua situation, monitoring some of the other guys who could come out and who could stay. That as they make their decisions, but yeah, just the, this whole the whole declaring thing is is very very tricky um, and a very difficult topic to discuss. Just because everybody's situation is different, whether it's school related, family related, whatever it is, everybody's situation is a little bit different. So it's hard to just be on one side of the fence or the other. But um, I'm always going to be a fan of guys leaving as early as they can because, again, you're not getting paid in the NCAA. So go make that money, but just make sure you're smart about it. Make sure you get a proper evaluation so you're not risking losing money by coming out and then instead of being the first or second round pick like you thought, now you're a fourth, fifth round pick, and then and then it's like, oh, I should just stay in school. So, uh, Like I said, that the Tua situation and that Dylan Moses situation will be very interesting to monitor because, like I said, he said he was coming back, and now it doesn't sound like he – might come back. He might not depend on if he gets that insurance money, or he might he might just declare if he gets that insurance money from the loss of value. So that'd be interesting to follow. But so that's that's that. And then lastly, we're going to talk about All Star um, for the uh, the first round of uh, fan voting for the NBA All Star game it was out, and I have a bone to pick with fan voting, and I will tell you why that is right after this last break. Check out the show built around the women of MMA from the UFC, Invicta FC, Bellator, and one championship. We got the fights covered. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. The latest news of upcoming fights, discussions of previous matches. Join us as we talk to and about the biggest names in women's mixed martial arts, past, present, and future. When it's the women's fight game, you know where to listen to the Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. said all-star fan voting um where is the first round was um released today in terms of the top 10 of the front court players and the guards in each um uh conference and for the east the top the top for the front court was uh Giannis the top for the guards was Trey Young makes sense and then for the west the top for the front court was LeBron top for the guards was Luka again makes sense but that's not where my issue lies Mystery lies further down on those lists. For guards, for example, Alex Caruso was is in the top ten of fan voting for guards. Now, it I mean well I mean that, that that's bad, but also I forgot to mention that uh, Steph Curry's fourth, and I don't even I, I I have to double check, but I don't even know if he's played a game. No, I don't take the back. He got hurt, so he has to he has to play in a game. See, I think he played like what a couple games this year. And he's fourth in fan voting, and I'm like, for what? Yeah, he played in four games in total this year. Wasn't even that good in those four games. Shot 20, 24% from three. But that's here or there. But yeah, so it's things like that where the fan voting in sports all-star games matters. 
Does it matter a lot? Not necessarily, which is good because they've taken some power and shifted away from the fans. But at the same time, it matters enough to where these um, these kind of these votes for these certain players can affect the lower tier guys on the on the balloting. Because like obviously your main guys, your LeBrons, the Anthony Davises, and um, in football like the Pro Bowl guys, like the Aaron Donalds, the Patrick Mahomes, Lamar Jackson. Christian McCaffrey, like all the Michael Thomas, DeAndre Hopkins, like the top guys, this is not where it hurts. It hurts those mid to lower two guys that are fighting for those bottom of the roster spots. So guys like, um, for example, in the NBA, like a Devin Booker, who is on a bad team, but he's played well. He has um, pretty good numbers on the season for himself, but he is uh, ninth. In voting right now, again, behind Alex Caruso and uh, Steph Curry. Why? I don't know. But yeah, he's he's, shoot, he's he's got 20, he's averaging 25 this year and 6 assists. Obviously, the Suns aren't as good as they hope to be. But he's averaging 25 and 6, all-star caliber numbers, um, 90% from the free throw line, uh, 36% from three, 50% from the field. And he's behind Alex Caruso in fan voting. And obviously, like again, I said, Alex Russo, is is he going to make the All-Star roster? No, obviously not. But it's like the same thing when they had Zaza a couple of years, and I, I'll get to another big issue I have with the with the fan voting in the East. Like, I mean, Alex Russo was averaging five points, two rebounds, and a one in, in less than two assists a game. Like, why is like why is that even? Why is his name even popping up? Like, just be and again, is this all because fans just want to have fun? He's on the Lakers. Uh, they're going to vote for him. But I'm like, why is he even? Why is he even taking up? Votes, because the guys like the Devin Booker's may not get enough votes. Well, he's not going to get enough votes to get in as a starter, and then because of the some of the fan votes that that would have helped push his ballot up a little bit higher, he may be a guy that maybe misses out on the All Star game. Um, just barely. Maybe he gets in as an injury replacement or whatever, but he may not. And like, there's no guarantee of that. And these All Star games matter because of because the you, you people count them when. You're talking about accolades for getting into the Hall of Fames, whether that's um, the Pro Bowl in the NFL or All-Star Games in MLB or NBA. And then they help in contract negotiation time in terms of like how many All-Star Games you made, how many All-NBA teams, or All-Pro teams, Pro Bowl, stuff like that. So I'm saying if the players have to take this seriously, even though many people refer to it as a popularity contest, and I get that because it's for the fans and the entertainment, really. There's, there's no real bearing on the game other than bragging rights. Like especially especially not at least in the I mean I don't know if it's better but at least in MLB it, it determines home field advantage for the World Series so that game does matter but for the for um, the NBA and for the NFL those games don't really matter so it's all just fan service so I get the the thought process of like oh the fans should get to pick who they want to see but at the same time if we're going to use these same accomplishments to determine who gets into a Pro Bowl um who gets into the Hall of Fame in their respective sports, then like there has to be stricter guidelines on on who should and shouldn't be um, able to be voted into the All Star Game. Because like I said, they're not gonna these guys aren't gonna get in. On the East side, they had Taco Falls name was on the front court list in the top ten above. Um, Give me a second. Above guys like um, Bam out of bio, who's had a great year, maybe is one of the top three guys for most improved player of the year. Demontis Sabonis, who's again who's having a great year, and Taco Falls, and then just because he's he's a interesting guy and he's on the Celtics. And I'm just like, why? Like why? Like why? Why is this? Like why is this a thing? Like why do fans like? I don't understand why fans like doing this. Like why? I mean, they did it with Zaza a couple years ago. I'm like, why are we just making? a joke of the voting when players care about this as they should and it matters for determining who gets into the most prestigious hall in their respective sports. So if they have to take it seriously and you can see the way players campaign for it, the players want to be on it. Like again, it helps them with contract negotiations, it helps them get more money, get more sponsorships, things like that. So like if they have to if they take it seriously, like why don't the fans take it at least a little bit more serious? Again, they stripped them from enough power, so it's not strictly fan voting like the media and the coaches and, and other stuff. There's other factors that go into determining who makes these all-star teams or Pro Bowl rosters or what have you. But 
the fact that the the lower tier guys may miss out because their fan voting was so low because of guys like Alex Russo or Steph Curry got hurt, or even like Kyrie was like, I think he's like, what, second or third? Yeah, he's second. And he's played like 11 games or something. Like, it's like he's missed all this time. Like, how is he still, like, he very well can, I mean, I don't think he will make a starter because he, he can't because he's hurt. Like, if he comes back before the All-Star break and he's played like, I mean, no one knows when he's going to come back. So he's played like, what, like 20, 25 games in the first half of the season. It's like, how do you justify him being an All-Star? But because the fans voted him in, now he can make it in. And I'm just like, that's not that's not fair to a guy like Kemba or, or yeah, a guy like Kemba or like a Trey Young who, well, Trey Young is a tough spot because he's he's been great, but the team hasn't been that great. But a guy like Kemba who maybe may miss out on it just because of the fan voting situation, and I'm like, that's a, being voted as a starter and also game is a big deal to the players, to to everybody. So I'm like, there has to be a better way to do this in terms of, voting in for these type of awards. I mean, voting for these type of teams, just because the fans don't take it that seriously. Like, I mean, even if you look at the Pro Bowl, I know we talked about it before with the snubs, but it's like even certain points, like people just get in on reputation just because they are popular. Like Aaron Rodgers and Drew Brees made it this year. Aaron Rodgers wasn't better than a couple other quarterbacks in the NFC this year. And Drew Brees missed five games. We still got in because their reputation and known as good quarterbacks. And I'm just like, ah, how does that work? So now they get an extra... Pro Bowl attacked onto their accolades, which, I mean, good for them. But then guys like Kirk Cousins and, and Dak, and maybe like or Jimmy G or whoever, like miss out on a possible Pro Bowl nod, which, again, is used to determine if a guy's worthy at the end of his career, if he had a good enough career to be worthy of entering the halls. They talk about how many Pro Bowls you made, how many All-Pro teams you made. And I'm just like, if the fan voting messes that up, because the fans just want to see, like, ah, I don't really care. I see Kirk Cousins. I, even though he's deserving, I want to see Aaron Rodgers instead. Like, how how is that fair? That's that's my thing with fan voting. I mean, it's not it's not just in sports. It's in where they have like these um, singing competitions or any any comp- dancing competitions, whatever competitions where you can vote for guys. Yeah, it happens in everything. But like I'm saying, those may help determine who wins. But like that's just determine who wins the season. Usually, it plays out fine. These help. These are for like. Players like live years, like millions of dollars could be on the line if they don't make, if, if they don't get certain accolades in terms of their contract negotiations. And then also they might not get into the Hall of Fame. So I would just hope for that the fans begin to take it a little bit more seriously. Or we're going to need to constrain, continue to strip them of some of their power. Because they shouldn't have that much, this much say if they're not going to take it as seriously as they should. That's just my personal opinion. I, I believe you should be. If you're going to actually vote for the best guys, the most deserving guys, fine. But if you're going to just do this for, for, for jokes and giggles and all that other stuff, and I'm just like, then there has to be some way to weed weed those guys out. Because there's no reason injured guys should be top five of their position in all-star voting. There's no reason guys who are barely even getting any playing time for their respective teams should be ahead of guys who, who are actually having great years and helping to carry their teams, no matter the sport. And I just think... I think that that's, I mean, this is something I need to get off my chest. I, I've had an issue with fan voting and a lot of things, and it's just like, it's like, yeah, like, I mean, like Dwight, like Dwight Howard, having a great year. Is he a top 10 front court player? Like, probably not. Like, how does Brent, like, Brent Ingram's only one spot ahead of him. I mean, it's like, well, like 50,000 more votes, but I'm saying he's only one spot ahead of him, he's ninth. And he's having a great year. Again, another candidate for most improved. But it's like, uh, and I mean, Melo, like, Melo, that's great that he's back in the league, but, like, he shouldn't be on the All-Star team. Like, we're not, he hasn't been, he's been great for the Blazers and he's helped them, but their team hasn't been that much better with him. They still struggle. They just lost to the Knicks by, like, 20. And, he, and Melo played well. Again, not completely his fault, but I'm just saying, like, it's like little things like that. Just, like, the fan voting. Again, it's not the be-all and end-all for these awards. Thank goodness. But... If the fans continue to not take it seriously, we gotta do something about it. That's my personal opinion. You guys may very well disagree, and if you do disagree, please feel free to let me know on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, wherever you are. Follow us on all the social medias. That'll do it for me here today. Oh, there's one more thing I wanted to touch on, and just to give my condolences to the family, friends. If David Stern passed away, he helped bring the. Obviously, he took over before my time, but he helped. He helped bring the league to heights that 
people weren't sure he was capable of reaching. And, and I mean, the league wouldn't be where it is today without his influence and his willingness to make the players the forefront of the league. And many, I mean, other sports leagues, the NFL name, we should follow that. Obviously, it's different now with social media, but he was doing that at a, at a time where other sports weren't really doing that. They were focusing on the franchises and the teams. And he was the one pushing, like, no, the players are the stars. Let's make them the stars. And it turned the basketball into the one of, if not the biggest global game. I mean, probably behind soccer, but one one of the biggest global sports in the world. And a lot of that was because of David Stern's influence. So I'd be, it would be inappropriate for me to not at least offer up my condolences to him and his family and to the and to the league and to the sport because he's one of the pioneers and he definitely will be missed. But that is my time here today. I want to thank you guys for listening to another episode of the GSMC Sports Podcast presented by GSMC Podcast Network. As I already said, follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, wherever you are. We're there, so follow us. You can reach out to us that way. We can talk about maybe you guys believe fan voting is the best way to do this. So we can talk about that. I mean, obviously, I obviously I disagree, but we can talk about it. Also, if you can, make sure you subscribe to the podcast um, so you never miss an episode. Um, give us a five star rating and review if you can. Like I said, it's very helpful. Helps us get better. Helps see where we can improve. Helps see what you guys like, what you guys don't like. Make sure we continue to give you guys dope content week in and week out. And that'll do it here for me. I will catch you guys next time. Peace out. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.